Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great. I love this crowd. Uh, my name is Amir Sadegi. Uh, I am a senior legal counsel at the Office of Tenant Advocate. And uh, welcome to uh, Tenants Rights 101 for uh, real estate agents. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize for the confusion and the lack of signage. Uh, pointing you up here uh, at not LA. He's not wearing a lab. So at OTA, so make sure that it never happens again, but apologies for any inconvenience. Uh, second, uh, there's going to be someone here at about 12 o'clock or so to uh, give you instructions with regard to sign out because obviously, as we know, to get the CLE credits, or not CLE credits, but the credits, you're going to need to sign in and sign out. Uh, so you know, we'll let you know about that. Uh, we're having just a few technical difficulties here, and we're, we're getting it uh, straight away now. Uh, hopefully, within the next couple of minutes, we're going to get started. Uh, and we have uh, two wonderful presenters here for you today. We have uh, Erickson McGee, Meiji, and uh, Sean Trainer, uh, who are going to take you through this course, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any concerns, any feedback that you'd like to share with us, please do so. We, we would love to get your feedback. And, and we, we do actually incorporate it. Last year was the first year that we did provide this course, and there was a lot of feedback that we got that, hey, we want more TOPA, more TOPA. So we actually adjusted the presentation to, to uh, reflect that feedback. So thank you again for being here. We hope you have a wonderful time, uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the week. All right, so we are still working on the PowerPoint. Fortunately, the booklet that you have is identical to what you would be seeing on the screen right now. So, we appreciate your patience. We are going to do this in a little fashion way. Okay. This is a little embarrassing. I'm red, green, colorblind. I've got to ask my friend here what is it? This is green, and it's working because you can hear my voice. Yes. I got it. I got it. So, so as I'm here just introduced, I'm Harrison. This is my friend and colleague Sean. And today, we're going to give you a presentation, a general overview of renters' rights in the District of Columbia, specifically here for realtors. This is, we hope that this will be a very interactive presentation. If you have any questions, do feel free to raise your hand. We have a lot of time for there to be questions. We are hope, we are very hopeful that you will have plenty of questions. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. So there are well, 14 parts to this presentation. We're going to be starting with applying for rental housing, identifying and verifying the rental unit, disclosures, leasing, moving in, security deposits and rental receipts, rent control, housing code and relocation assistance. We will be taking a break in the middle, don't worry. Quiet enjoyment and protection against discrimination, evictions, protections against retaliation and the right to organize, conversion, and I know this is probably the part that is most important to you, tenant right to purchase, otherwise known as TOPA, and that law was recently revised extensively. So, and also we will conclude with moving out. Okay. So, what is the first step when someone is renting a unit? Application. Right, an application. Yeah. It's very important to know what can and cannot go on a rental application. I don't know. I know many realtors deal with sales, but I know. Do any of you ever help? Uh, landlords who are just trying to rent out a place or take around prospective tenants. Wonderful. So, 
what can and cannot go on an application. A landlord can ask for identification, social security number, as well as rental history, landlord references, and employer references. But there are limits. For example, if you do have a cosigner, be aware that the cosigner is, is going to be 100% liable for the lease. At the same time, a landlord does have the right to forbid cosigners unless it is deliberately aimed at students. It, is, it would be a ploy to specifically not have to rent to a group of people. There are also limits to criminal record screening. There is a law that specifies when and what can be examined, and it is usually not allowed until an initial offer has been made. Furthermore, the landlord can demand a holding, the, there can be a holding fee, but be sure to get a receipt and confirm in writing that the holding fee is refundable. Now, touring the unit at the time of the application is not the same as an actual walkthrough movement inspection at the time of occupancy. I looked at a unit that I ended up moving into while the previous tenant was there. I wanted to see it again right when I was moving in. And the tenant can and should demand to see the actual unit that they will be moving into, not a showcase unit. Excuse me. Yes? Is, is, is the security deposit and hold fee, are they, are they the same thing? No, those are two different things. We are going to have a separate section regarding security deposits. And the application fee is sometimes a nominal fee for the landlord to be able to run a credit check. A security deposit is a, is a security deposit is separate, but we will get to that. Yes. Um, so you said there are limits to the criminal record screening. Yes. What type of limits? Is it? Uh, for example, on an initial application, the law changed about a year ago. The landlord is not supposed to ask if someone has a criminal record. They, run a, they can run a general background check, and then at that point, if they are otherwise willing to rent the unit to the person, they can then ask for certain disclosures. I do not have that in front of me. It is a, it is a pretty extensive list regarding how far back the landlord can ask and also for what types of crimes. And where would I find that? That would be on the Office of Human Rights website, ohr.dc.gov. Yes, sir. No. The holding fee is what you would be paying to express interest in the unit. Sometimes that can be a down, a down payment on the rent. To hold the unit. And, and keep in mind the holding fee, you're talking about a refundable holding fee, you are essentially Yes. And then after processing the application, you tell them that we check the tenant. Yes, for cause, not for. And the holding fee should be refunded. Yes. Yes, sir. And the holding fee and the application fee be applied to the security deposit? Sure. The security deposit, though, ultimately, if it is going to be a if it is going to be up to one month's rent to be put aside just in case to ensure against damage against the unit, that cannot exceed one month's rent. We will have a separate section about security deposits, so I do ask that you bear with us. We will get to security deposits. All right. Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, if 
But again, it is very defined criteria. It's not. It can't be for. It's not any and all criminal history. There are. There's a. Oh. So I, I, I think that begs that question. What you can do is you can make a provisional offer. You can say we we will provisionally you have passed our background check subject to the criminal background check we would like, now would like to conduct. And what that does is it puts out in the open whether the criminal background check is the reason you rejected it, which is kind of how someone can tell based on their criminal background, was this beyond the scope of what the criminal background checks are allowed to be. But again, I, neither of us have off the top of our head, the, there's a list of kind of what crimes and how many years ago it can be, more serious crimes can be longer ago, but you can find all of that in the text of the law. It does not need to be in writing in your application. You just can't uh, ask for a criminal background check before you've made that provisional offer, and it has to be limited. It doesn't have to be anything in your lease disclosing that. And the law doesn't say that. What you can't do, though, is ask the person, or certainly not on the initial application. It, the, the bottom line is whether the tenant has a criminal history should be considered an off-limits subject unless and until a provisional offer is made. Yes, please. It can't be used at the initial application. Once a provisional offer is made in the sense that the tenant otherwise qualifies, at that point, a landlord can ask for certain information. What information can be requested and can be used as a basis for rescinding the offer is very, there is a specified list, and I encourage you to check out the Office of Human Rights on that. Uh, Yes, you and then you. So oftentimes um, when you're doing um, uh, your application process, uh, of course, information as to whether or not a uh, prospective tenant has been the landlord's control, which would, would determine whether or not you know, you're going to accept them. That comes up on the criminal Yes. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, um, would we need to, as you said, give a provisional approval subject to the review of that file, or can I review that file before giving them? A landlord tenant file is not a criminal file, so. It comes up on the criminal history from a third party. You know, if, they, if they've been, if there was ever a filing. Or um, a notice for them to go to court. That's where you're. Okay, so may I rephrase your question? Are you asking if after a provisional offer is made, are you asking if it can only be taken back? It can be taken back only if a criminal record is found. But if something else is found, it's oops, you missed that. Well, no. My question is that I'm trying to understand. See the provisional, and and then subject to that. What the criterion of in most cases, as I said, if you have, if I have a tenant or a prospective tenant who has multiple um, uh, filings on their record, that's going to be that's a point for doing that. Yes. You can do understand the question. Is it the class? So if your business practice is the time that I find out that the tenant is LNT is only once I do the criminal background check. That what the law says is before you can do that criminal background check, you have to make a, a provisional offer or reject them on their merits without the information you get from there. Now, I know, we know there are other ways to find out if someone's going to help you decide a criminal background check. You could do that before you make the provisional offer, or you could make the provisional offer and then rescind it once the criminal background check shows this person's been to L&T. And having been to L&T is not protected by, by this law. It's just the timing of when you get to a criminal background. And, oh. As well as what exactly, in terms of crimes, can be a reason to not offer the apartment. Oh. Being evicted is not a crime. It's a civil 
Okay, so you and you, and then I'm going to have to ask that we move on to the next slide. All right. So, uh, we have been to landlord tenant court for other uh, landlords is not a basis for rejection. No, it can be. Yeah, that's not a protected class. Okay, so uh, you won't find that out until uh, after. Well, it, oh, sorry. It depends on what background check a person it depends on what background check a person runs. So that is there is a, the point is the Criminal Records Screening Act does not forbid a landlord from checking a civil record okay. before a provisional offer is made. Yeah, it's going to run a general background check that checks the person's creditworthiness, that checks against their civil records. What you can't be doing is commissioning a criminal background investigation. Listen. Until this provisional offer is made. All right. Absolutely. O is an orange, H as in Harrison, R as in Robert, dot DC, dot G O V. All right. So, what is your. Okay, so if you do your criminal check after the provisional offer is made and you find that there are LMC matters, yeah, there's yeah. nothing in the law that says that's not yeah. the reason yeah. to withdraw your offer. Uh, there's nothing in the law that protects you because you have a uh, history of eviction. It's just specific criminal matters that you're not supposed to take into account. So if you choose to do your entire court check after the provisional offer is made, and you find civil matters that distress you, whether those be landlord, tenant, or bad debts, or whatever, those are all still totally fair game. Now, that being said, one more caveat. In gen there is also, separate and apart from all of this, but complementarily, there is contrast law. If you make an offer to someone and then you pull it back, there could, there could be litigation. Frankly, I strongly suggest that you, if you're preparing a rental application or have any clients who have them, to please talk to an attorney for specific legal interventions. And it, it does make sense to have a handle on the timing of when certain information is really what to All right, now, the next slide is the next page. We're trying to get the PowerPoint off, but in the meantime, identifying the unit. Obviously, that person who wants to look at what type of a unit they want, very subjective criteria, the amenities, how big of an apartment they personally want, also how much they can afford, where it is located. The next part is extremely important. When you are going online, be sure to check and verify. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The other day, there was a news story about people who have seen online apartments. They wired money to someone, even to someone who turned out to be a person they had a licensed realtor, and then the money goes off to who knows where, and they don't get it back. So with that, beware of renting any property that you don't look at first. I have unfortunately had to speak with people who did not look at the apartment and when they got there, it was, let's just say, horrible. Also, again, if it's too good to be true, if you have a listing that just uses very just strange language, stuff that sounds very archaic, if you are asked to electronically transfer any money, and also, double check to see that the address is real. There have been stories of people who put down a rental deposit and they didn't realize they were renting Yankee Stadium. That yeah. does happen. Now, this part, is, this part is also extremely important for realtors. When a tenant, a prospective tenant, applies for an application, here. 
They just need to know how to get which file. Excuse me, I'm just gonna pull, we're turning to the next page about what the housing providers must provide. I'm just gonna pull up the presentation. Is, it, is the hourglass on? All right. The landlord must, and I mean must, possess a basic business license for rental housing, and it needs to actually be for the size of the building. Furthermore, unless it is a single family dwelling, there must be a certificate of occupancy. And finally, rental housing must be registered with the Department of Housing and Community Development. These are essential steps that all too frequently are not complied with and can risk significant fines not to mention other penalties. This is basic due diligence for any landlord who wants to rent out their housing. Yes? Must the uh, okay. basic business license be on display and clearly visible? Yes. Depending on the size of the building, the regulations get very specific about where that is posted. I do not have that in front of me, but I can. I, can, I am happy to, during the break, write down where you would check that. All right, pardon me, I, oh, she, she was ahead of you. I will get to you right after. Thank you again for your patience. You've all been wonderful. Which one do you want if you're renting out a rooming house? 
the, yeah, thank you. The, the reality is that there is, um, there is law on the books regarding how rooming houses are supposed to work, and there is law in the books that uh, contradicts that law, and it's a bit of a mess. Yes. Um, and so in terms of being safe when you're running a rooming house, my, my best advice would be uh, to get a multifamily business license. Um, and talk to an attorney. Well, yeah, talk to an attorney, but get, get a multifamily business license. The zoning issue, if you don't happen to have lucked into the right zoning, you're not going to get it. There's, no, to my knowledge, no path to getting the right zoning at this point for a rooming house. But Actually, Sean, I was just the other day, and if you give me your email address, I can try to send this to you this week. I did see a case where, through the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, someone did get fined. For even though they had a single family unit, because they were right running a rooming house, they were required to have a certificate of occupancy. I do not know. I will have to check that. But also, oh sorry. But then, in that being said, there are also zoning rules about that. One more question: the certificate of occupancy. Just to jump in, but it it, it clearly says that uh, certificate of, of occupancy is required for all dwellings, except for single family dwellings that are the that are used as the residence. And I, I would read that best as used exclusively as your residence. So I think you do need a certificate of occupancy. I think the zoning is something that's unlikely to, to come to haunt you. Also keep in mind if you're trying to run a rooming house that, what is it, 60% of the people living there have to be there on a short term basis. There has to be a significant amount of turnover. At some point, if you've got people living in a rooming house who are there month after month, year after year, guess what? It's not a rooming house, it's a group home. And, you know, just like in Georgetown or something like that. And and so your flexibility gets there. Okay, one more question, then we can move to the next slide. Can you just repeat what people are saying? Because we can't hear what oh, everyone is saying, okay. and you're responding. So I don't Very know. good point. We Sorry. will do that in the future. Okay. Okay, I can tell you right now, I believe the council is actually going to be addressing legislation about that this Tuesday at their upcoming, at their next meeting. That law is very in flux right now. I will say this, if you are even thinking about doing Airbnb or representing someone who does, please talk to an attorney in D.C. who is versed in that. Yeah. Particularly, speak to an attorney about Airbnb if you're thinking about having an Airbnb <coughs> an apartment building that, that contains other tenants, because that is what has led to litigation so far. It's other tenants saying, I'm not getting what I paid for. I didn't pay to live in a hotel. I was to pay in an apartment building. Um, and that's what led to the OAG suit for last year. And that's what is leading, I think, to this um, litigation. The, the, the kind of political pressure on, I have a single family home and I'm using it for Airbnb is yes. not there in the city. It's, it's when it comes to apartment buildings. So we'll see what the law ultimately says if it passes on Tuesday because of the legislative schedule of Congress. My understanding is if it doesn't get introduced and pass through the committee on Tuesday, there's no way it's happening this year. Stand by for that. now. But this next part is more of a caveat for tenants. If for some reason the landlord didn't get licensed or registered, that does not render the lease null, void, or unenforceable. The lease will likely remain binding. Nonetheless, that is not an excuse to not comply, and even if the contract is upheld, the landlords can and do get fined for not complying with this section. I'm just curious. Did, does anybody know what the consequence is of not getting registered? There's, there's really only one. There's one thing that the law says happens if you don't register the unit. Well, you can get fined for not having a business license. But what happens if you don't register with REB? Can't you can't you get refunds on the rent? Noise yeah, but you can't raise the rent. What what happens if you if you don't register with RAD is the law says no rent increases until you do. 
Now there are, there's what the law says and then there's what courts are willing to do, particularly when we're talking about small landlords who only own one unit or two units. But particularly if you're talking about a large apartment building, if you don't have that registration, you could end up on the hook for three years worth of rental refunds, rolling the rent back to 1985 potentially. So and possibly, that's not what you want to do. Possibly even longer, depending on statute of limitations. Again, it is very important to get legal advice on that. Uh, I see your question there. I just want to review. So this slide actually reiterates some of what was said just now. The landlord has to have a business license. They need to be on file with the, with the Rental Accommodations Division. They also need to have the Certificate of Occupancy where applicable. This information must be disclosed to rental applicants, they, even if they haven't signed a lease yet. Furthermore, the landlord must provide the rent, and also, if there has been mold in the unit or common area in, previous three, in the previous three years, unless it was remediated by a licensed professional. Dan, did you still have a question? Okay. We will get to 30 day notices later in the presentation. The Department of Housing and Community Development is a freestanding department, as is the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. Business licenses, compliance with certificates of occupancy and housing code, that is, that is something that DCRA polices, whereas Department of Housing and Community Development deals with registration or claims of exemption, and also that is where someone can file a tenant petition or a housing provider petition, which we will get to. And furthermore, excuse me, any notices to quit, to correct, or vacate other than non-payment of rent are supposed to be served on the rent administrator. We will get to that later in the presentation. All right. Furthermore, if rent control applies to the unit, the applicant must also be provided with any pending tenant or housing provider petitions that may affect the rent or the rental unit, a copy of any housing code violation report issued by DCRA within the last 12 months and for any other violations that remain unabated. There's also a pamphlet published by the rent administrator that explains the requirements for renting leases. And again, as we said earlier, no business license or not properly registered, no rent increase. Furthermore, to all new and existing tenants, there are excerpts that must be provided of the housing regulations. And also, for rent control units, the last three rent increases for the unit and the basis for each of those increases. This is extreme, this is designed to be very strict. The landlord is supposed to make these disclosures, period. Yes, ma'am. Sixty-two. I think that's where you're having. That is for that for for tenants who are sixty-two years of age or older, or tenants who have a disability. We will get to that shortly. If the unit is rent controlled, there are limits to the amount of the allowable rent increase. We will get to that. Furthermore, there are lead safety disclosures that are required under federal and district law. There is, an app, there is a pamphlet about protecting your family from lead in your home. And also, the, Depart the District Department of Energy and the Environment must also, you also must provide a tenant lead rights for Okay, so now we're done.
that is possible. Honestly, I don't have that right in front of me. I'll say this though, if in doubt, why not include that? Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Okay, here. I don't know what you're talking about. Someone asked the question whether or not like disclosures are always required, for example, if the place was built like a year ago. The answer is it might not be. There is a presumption that anything that was built 1978 or before has lead paint in it. This is what I'm going to say. Again, if in doubt, include it. It is really an easy thing to include. Yes, it may cost a few extra pages, but frankly, in general, I think it's worth it. Yes, ma'am. This is what I can this is what I can tell you. The lease that I have in my building literally just has a printout of a set part of the of chapter of Title 14 of the District of Columbia Municipal Regulations. I don't have the specifics in front of me now about what sections, but once again, that is really that's not a hard thing to comply with. This is just part of that. Now that actually dovetails nicely into the lease. A tenant landlord relationship, we're assuming that the tenant was accepted and they signed, they are interested in moving in, is established. The tenancy is established by a contract. Under this contract or lease, the tenant and the landlord each have certain rights and certain obligations. Like other contracts, the lease may be written. It is legal to have an oral lease. As a matter of common sense, I'm going to say right now, do not do an oral lease. Please. That is so much more trouble than it's worth. If you are going to have a written lease, and again, I think that is extremely, that is very wise, the landlord must provide the tenant with a copy of the lease and all the addendums. The landlord may not change the terms of the lease without the tenant's agreement. Now, the last part is probably one of the most unique aspects of DC landlord tenant law. So, if you've been dozing off, please pay close attention to this part. After the initial lease term expires, the tenant has the right to continue the tenancy indefinitely on a month-to-month -month basis under the same terms except for lawful rent increases. So yes, if legal, if it's rentable, exempt, the landlord is allowed to raise the rent when the law allows, but the mere fact that the lease is up does not end the tenancy. The tenant can choose down the tenancy, but the landlord may not say, tenancy over, lease expired, bye-bye. This is very common when you have a group of tenants living together. That literally means the tenants are all responsible for each other. They are their brother's keeper. If one person does not pay rent, the other person can be held fully responsible for that. Yeah, I, I want to jump in and ask a question. If you've got a joint and several lease, okay, and, and the lease continues for as long as the tenants care to continue paying their full rent, what happens when one of the joint and several tenants wants to move out and one doesn't? What is the, does the lease I mean, say that? That's, that's uh, what, what I heard is a bunch of different answers and what that tells me is there is not an answer in the law. This is a problem. Please put something in your lease that says what happens in that circumstance. You can, it can be whatever you like, but just please have something in there that says, if one of you wants to move out, the other one has to take on the full lease, or you can't move out until you all agree on it, or if one of you comes to me and says, we the tenants want to move out, I can take that as everyone saying it. Just 
put something in so it's not totally ambiguous. I'm, I'm, I'm just tired of people coming to my office saying my roommate wants to move out or I want to move out, the other one doesn't, and the landlord doesn't know who to listen to. The law just does not define it. Yeah. And That that so the the question was does does that mean that if one of the five wants to move out there's no protection for the other four and I would rephrase that is you've got two groups of tenants here with two groups of rights one group of tenants in this scenario has the right to continue living there the other has the right not to be party to a contract they don't want to be part of forever. Right at the mercy of these other tenants, and so my my read of the law is that there is there is nothing prohibiting whatever kind of language you want to put in there that expresses what will happen in this scenario. Just put something unambiguous so that the tenants know ahead of time. I think you'll be doing yourself a favor, and frankly, the tenants a favor. So answer, my question is that if you write it in there. To, all right, here's the thing. In general, that is possible, but again, separate and apart from the Rental Housing Act, we still have general contract law. I urge all of you to tell your clients, or if you're the one that wants to get the paperwork, please talk to a licensed DC attorney who does who specializes in this area. I, I, I believe so. I believe that if you have something written in the lease, if everyone signed it, heck, if you get them to initial next to it, that says, any one of you can give me notice that you, the tenants, want to move out, and I can take that at your word. I don't have to go check with the other tenants. And then if somebody does it and the other tenants are saying, what the heck have you done to me? But their problem is with the other tenant, not with you. You just took them at their word that the tenants wanted to move out. So can you put in there, uh, you can come to me and say, I want you to kick all of us out because I hate my roommates? Maybe not, but you can certainly put in there, you have to, you have to come to me unanimously when you decide you want to end your tenancy, and I can take a writing from any one of these joint and several tenants as that unanimous declaration. And then let the tenants work out for themselves. Okay, what do you... Right. That is, the, the scenario, there, I think there are, there are some complications in your scenario that, that go beyond just the question of whether you can lay out simple um, rules about what the procedure is for letting you know the destroyed ten, several tenancy is ending. For instance, if one person's moved to Arizona, but the others are continuing to pay their rent, have you defined what abandonment means? Have they really abandoned their lease? If one person is still there and they're paying the full rent for this other person, have they, have they actually moved out? But if you put in clear terms about this is how you, this is how you end your joint and several tenancy, and if any one of you does this, that ends the tenancy, I think it, it can get messy. So we'll, we'll get to Yeah. Okay, sir, here's the thing. I think that the, your question is now starting to get 
very fast, specific. I'm not saying it's a bad question. It's, it's a good thing. question. We need it's on detail. Yes. So some things to look for in the lease besides joint and several liability, the amount that's due at move-in, if the unit is exempt from rent control, any rent increases or discounts that could also apply in a rent control unit. Paying the rent on time and how to pay rent, that is, what date is the rent due? If there is to be, a, there, the law actually does require a grace period on low fees. We will get to that. What methods of payment are acceptable? If there is going to be a, a penalty for late payment, that has got to be in the contract. There is no gap filler. If, if the lease does not provide for late payments at all, the landlord might not be able to collect any late fee. Furthermore, are there any fees in addition to the rent? If the unit is rent controlled, this is something that may need to be run through the rent administrator. Let me finish the slide and I will get to it. Also, what is included and not included in the rent? For example, who pays for water, gas, electricity, trash, climate control, yard maintenance? Is subleasing allowed? If it is allowed, what are the criteria? What are the reasonable guidelines? And also, as we were just discussing, move out notification. Can, only, can one person stand for everyone else, or does everyone have to be unanimous? Ma'am, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I think I want to ask you a question about the law thing regarding um, the, the amount of late fees that one can collect, and while it may have been good practice to have it at, I don't know, the more than 5% of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the rent, now I think it's actually written. And so how, how does the law look at uh, leases that supersede that law being coming into effect? Okay. So In general, this is again something where I'm going to have to, I know, frustratingly urge legal advice for specific instances. If a lease, for example, has a 10% late fee provision, even if it was signed before the new law came into effect, there might be a question of if it can apply to, if it, in, even if it might not be enforceable towards months of rent that came due before the law came into effect. Afterwards, in general, a contract cannot supersede the law. There are discrete places in the Rental Housing Act that do say where a landlord and a tenant can agree to something alternative. Late fees are not one of them. In order for a landlord to charge a late fee, the, le the lease must specifically say that the landlord can charge a late fee. The late fee must be specified. It must not exceed 5%. Anything above that is forbidden. And furthermore, the tenant must be given at least a five-day grace period before a late fee can be charged. Also, Late fees cannot be the subject of an eviction. They can be taken out of a security deposit later. We will get to that. Furthermore, the late fee cannot roll over. So if a landlord charges a tenant a late fee for one month, they do not, they are not, they can't have a negative balance going into the next month if they had otherwise paid their rent. There is what there should be a slide later on late fees, so if there's anything else, we will go there. General common sense caveats. Don't have blank spaces in a lease. That's like handing a blank check to someone. Also, I know some landlords are squeamish about contact information, but please, please urge your clients to have contact information where a live person will respond in a reasonable amount of time. One, one second, please. Also, be very careful of high late, you know, high late fees and other fees. We just talked about that. Also, sometimes besides the lease, individual buildings may have house rules. Those can be considered full part of the lease and enforceable. Yes, you had a question and so did you.
No, wait. No. Oh, no. So the question is, if someone doesn't pay their late fee, can you either deduct that late fee from the following month's rent, or can you refuse to accept that rent? The answer to both is no. The late fee and the rent are two separate accounts. You can sue the person for the late fee. Yeah. You can go to land, you can go to small claims court and say this person didn't pay a late fee that they lawfully owe, and you can sue them and recover it. It cannot be the basis for monkeying around with someone's possession of the apartment or the house. They continue, their tenants' rights are in no way impacted by their failure to pay the late fee any more than it's impacted by their failure to pay the phone bill. Your recourses are consumer debt recourses. You can sell the debt to a debt collector. You can go to credit reporting. You can sue them. But landlord tenant court doesn't want to hear it. But yes, you can't take out the security. No. OK. Yes, but the timing of that could be very tricky. So hold that question to when we get to security deposits. I'm sorry, did you, did you get a draft? Someone just asked a question about deducting late fees from a security deposit. The answer is that that may be allowed, but the timing of it needs to be very careful. So we will get to security deposits. Yes, ma'am, did you have another question? Ah, if it adds up to $100 million and it's just late fees, you cannot start eviction proceedings. However, the law does, if someone is consistently paying late, the law does allow evictions on the basis of habitual late payment. Remember, a grace period for when a late fee is due is not the same thing as a grace period for paying rent. So if a lease says that the rent is due on the first, it's due on the first. If the person pays on the second, they may be late. They might not get, they might not be able to be slapped with a late fee for it, but that does not mean that they have fully complied with their lease. So then so that's the that's the first line about the grace period. Be aware of any lease provision that with the grace period. Furthermore, Tenants should be very wary of signing any term that says that there is one house manager and that is the only person that the landlord will talk to. Furthermore, tenants are, should be very careful about leases that order them to find new tenants or to replace them and still be held liable. This is what I'm. This is what we're saying. This is that is that is obviously landlords and tenants sometimes have different interests. What those provisions are ones that if tenants come to our office to show us a prospective lease or ask if they should sign it, this is something that we frown on and tell them that they should be very careful about signing. Now, if the this is geared more towards tenants, this part. But if the landlord attempts to enforce an unenforceable lease clause, it is very important to seek legal advice. So for example, someone asked before about when the contract and the law get in conflict, what happens? 14, Chapter 3 of Title 14 of the DC Code of Municipal Regulations, the exact section escapes me does give a non-exhaustive list of clauses that should not be in the lease, but if they are in the lease, are unenforceable. I'll read the list right now. That the landlord may terminate the lease for any cause whatsoever, just like, oh, I don't like to have it anymore, so you have to move out. The tenant acknowledges that the property is fit for occupancy without actually moving in that the tenant waives the right to void the lease because of housing code violations, or that the tenant waives district code, uh, district housing code enforcement. The tenant cannot sign something that says that they agree to self-help eviction. The tenant cannot waive the right to receive a notice to quit, except for non-payment of rent. Also, the tenant cannot waive a jury trial in the event of a dispute in the lease. 
Also, the tenant cannot waive rights under the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Someone other than the tenant cannot confess judgment. The landlord cannot, it is unwaivable, the landlord's responsibility for basic maintenance. If the landlord is responsible, the landlord cannot waive liability for personal injuries caused by housing conditions. That a bankruptcy or foreclosure itself terminates the tenancy. And also assigning of attorney's fees in advance without court determination. Again, this is a non-exhaustive list. So be extremely careful here. Also, clauses that might not be illegal but are very questionable and should be looked at, looked at with skepticism. Complex arrangements for payment of utilities. For example, oh, if the landlord thinks that the tenant has been using too much water, then the landlord can pass the bill on to the tenant. Um, that if there's furniture left in the apartment, that it's the tenant's responsibility. They hate words like annoying or immoral behavior. Also, a tenant will be told to be very careful if they are asked to sign in advance a notice to terminate police at the same time as this execution. There would be a separate promise to vacate by a specific date. Also, very onerous limitations on subletting. A landlord may condition their consent on, on a prospective tenant meeting rental qualification guidelines that are provided to the tenant upon request. A landlord cannot be arbitrary or capricious or just make things up as they go along about what is a, what is a suitable subletting. Do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question Yes. And then uh, moving units in on a rotating basis. Yes. Well, and what's your question? So we have a question regarding someone moving in roommates on a rotating basis. Is that legal? Um, I don't have enough information to answer that. I, is what is your question? Is that like something? Oh, OK. So is it? Oh, yeah. If, if, if you have a master tenant, with, uh, which is or a, a sub landlord, which are the same thing, who brings in roommates who move out as as people come in. Depending on how they're doing it, there, there's no problem with that. In fact, from the landlord's perspective, renting to someone who you know is then going to rent out the the rest is not legally problematic at all. The, the reason my colleague is being hesitant is because to answer the full question of is the whole picture legally problematic, I need to know what that master tenant is doing. How are they treating their tenants? What kind of contracts are they signing? And I don't know because I don't know what terms this this uh, sub-landlord is giving to people when they move in. I don't know why people are moving out. So I have no more reason to say that's legal or illegal than any kind of question about is a, is a tenancy, a landlord-tenant relationship going okay? I don't know. Does that make sense? The, the fact that you've got a subtenant itself doesn't, doesn't, comp, doesn't mean that everything is legal or everything is illegal. It's just one more link in the chain. So they, they may be renting out a bedroom in an apartment that they are currently occupying. So from, from your perspective, renting to the subtenant doesn't really complicate the question. It's the same as the question of whether a rooming house is illegal. And remember, we went kind of round and around saying there's nothing really specifically in the law that says that running a rooming house is illegal. There's supposed to be kind of a process for registering them. It's defunct. And so they are in kind of a gray area. And that's the best I can answer when it comes to rooming houses, whether it's your rooming house or your tenant's rooming house. All right, we have three questions here, one, two, and three. Before getting to them, I do want to ask something. Have any of you ever been approached by a current tenant who wanted a realtor to help them find a subtenant? Anybody? Okay, well, even if that's never happened before, be aware that a sub-landlord has the responsibilities of a landlord. For a sub-tenant, for a sub-landlord to be able to charge rent, 
technically, they are supposed to get a business license and follow all the requirements of landlords. And the law is also very clear, a sub landlord may not profit off of a subtenant. Especially if the unit is rent controlled, I am not sure. I believe that that is for rent control units. Yes, sir. Subtenants, yes, absolutely. The landlord has the right to hold potential subtenants to objective criteria that are provided to the tenant on request. Those criteria can be as strict or as lax as you want. They just can't be purely <laughs> arbitrary, uh, only in your head. I can't really describe it. It's just a feeling in my heart. They just have to be objective and laid out. They can be extremely narrow, the, the type of tenant you're going to take. So, she didn't ask whether the landlord needed to have a say. She was asking whether there was anything illegal about the situation of having a master tenant who then worries about who lives there and you just get the check. And that in itself is also not problematic if that master tenant does everything legally. Now, oh, something to jump in with. The DC code does allow a landlord to outright forbid subleasing. That is allowed. That is straight from the law. But it has to say no sublease, no way, no how. It can't say no sublease unless I say okay. As soon as you say there's some possibility that I'll say okay to a sublease, you have to be objective about it. You can't just say, not nah, because I don't like you, or not nah, because I, I, I didn't get a good vibe from that person. If you want to have no subleases, it needs to say no subleases, no exceptions. Now, how do we stop you from actually making an exception if you said no subleases, no exception? Uh, of course, you probably can still make an exception, but if you, if you really don't want to have the possibility of a sublease, say no subleases under any circumstances. Now, two questions, and then I would like to go back to this slide. So, all right, wonderful. Yeah. And my question is <laughs> to her question. I guess whatever you, whatever the uh, initial tenant had in their in their lease, I would the landlord would tell them in that lease whether they were allowed subletting or not. Yes. And if and they allow sure. it, then it's okay. If they don't allow it. Yes, that's the point. You'll notice, as far as the list of forbidden lease terms, there is none that says that you're not allowed to allow subleasing. So is subleasing in of itself legal? The answer is it could be, but it does depend on other factors. For example, again, a sub-landlord who started off as a tenant, and actually still is a tenant to the main landlord, they are required to follow the responsibilities of a landlord. And that could put them in a tricky position because that is going to be at odds with each other. And just to, to address directly the, that question, your, your choice, and to just put an emphasis on it, your choice is in terms of subleasing, you have two options. One is no subleasing, no way, no how, under any circumstances. The other is subleasing allowed. I set the rules for who can sublease, what their qualities need to be, those have to be objective rules, and it has to be based on the sublease that you're bringing to me, not how I feel about you, not how I feel about the fact that you're moving out or you didn't pay any rent last month. It has to be, oh, this person you brought me is incredible worthy. So does that make sense? Two regimes for sublease. All right. Okay. Okay. I think we have a, we have a slide regarding this slide that passed. Okay, first and foremost, if someone has a service animal, the landlord may not forbid, a landlord may not outright say no pets whatsoever. That is opening them to a possible human rights act or disability discrimination suit. When it comes to pets, a landlord can have terms about 
about you know, about a, a, a pet deposit that is not the same as a security deposit, and if a pet is causing trouble to other people, it can be the basis for a lease violation pro process. Now, as far as may a landlord forbid pets, for example, just not for put inside the service animal, yeah. Yeah, so you can, you can allow pets, you can forbid pets, you can have a pet deposit. Uh, the, you, you, you could, uh, the, the law seems to say, you know, security deposits are limited to one month's rent and that's it. I have not seen people getting in trouble for having an additional reasonable pet deposit on top of that. But that doesn't it, it, could be, that, it could be challengeable. You can have pet rent as long as it's not in a rent controlled unit and bringing you above the maximum rent you're allowed to charge for the unit. And as so. far as service animals go, the law does allow for reasonable accommodation. A landlord outright refusing to even consider a reasonable accommodation, bad idea, do not do that. Yes. Unless the, like the condominium association, they don't allow pets in a particular building. Unless it's a service animal. Okay, yeah, that, I don't believe that a court would allow a condominium unless there was like a, an extremely excellent reason for why animals can't be allowed ever. That would probably not be, that it might not be enforceable. It is a service animal. Service animal. Yeah. So do you have to have documentation that shows that the animal is an actual service animal? All right, the answer, the landlord can probably ask for some documentation as far as the prying into what the disability is or insisting that the doctor actually document the medical condition that requires the pet. That might not be okay. And again, I would strongly suggest speaking to an attorney before. It's, yeah, it, if you have a tenant who's saying they need a service animal and you don't think they do, you think that they're just making it up? Talk to a lawyer because that can be a minefield. That's that's the short answer. Yeah. Uh, service animal, you're not supposed to like pry into. Okay, well, what exactly is wrong with you? How, what happened to your legs? Let's let me look at your knees. Like that's not okay. So On the other hand, you can demand that a doctor provide a note saying that this is needed for a medical reason. And we've all heard about companion animals and the issues with like. To what degree is, oh, I'm anxious and therefore I need a dog, uh, a valid medical reason? It's, it's very much in the gray right now. Obviously, there are extreme examples where it's ridiculous. There's probably equally obvious extreme examples where clearly this person needs some kind of, uh, you know, they're, they've got 24 hour uh, mental health care. This is, you know, and an animal's been prescribed by a psychiatrist. There's extremes. There's a line somewhere, the courts have not figured out where that line is. I would just say, you know, be, use good judgment. I will say, as you see your hand up, for a rent control unit, someone asked about how does someone document that they qualify for uh, a reduced increase on the basis of being elderly or having a disability. The Department of Housing and Community Development, and I believe they might actually have the forms out there, do we have documentation forms that if are approved by the rent administrator, the landlord and a rent control unit is obligated to accept them? Frankly, if you're a landlord, if, if you want to document if someone has a disability for a service animal, I think, I would say, again, if you're in dad, seek legal advice, but you don't want to go beyond. If, if the rent administrator's rules say that this form is acceptable for someone to say that they have a disability, don't go beyond it. Basically, if someone says, I need this animal for a disability, and you say, no, you don't, they may call Office of Human Rights, and Office of Human Rights will investigate. And they'll try to figure out what's going on. And they can ask a lot more questions than you can. So, <laughs> you know, just uh, be aware of your risks. Yes, sir. And then I do need to move on. All right, you know what? I'm gonna tell you the truth. I do not know the answer to that question. I, 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 discrimination based on- Oh, excuse me, me. discrimination based on breed. Like, uh, like, like the race, I, 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 I
there's 14 categories. Right. There's 14 categories of protected characteristics under the DC Human Rights Act. I am running through the list in my head. I cannot see where dog breed fits into any of those. I personally uh, have a, a Doberman and I love him and I love pit bulls, but uh, I do not, I cannot see thinking it through how you make a discrimination claim based on, you know, I'm a pit bull owner. Pit bulls, you know, from the point of view of the law, an animal is a chattel. It's not a person. It doesn't have personal rights. The owner has property rights in it. Uh, maybe someone can make a very creative family status argument and get a real dog lover panel on the Court of Appeals, and I, I don't know. But that, I, it doesn't pass the smell test for me at this moment just thinking about our Human Rights Act. Weight's a lot easier because weight obviously increases wear and tear on a building. Yeah. So it, it, it seems to me like that's much more, that's even more far fetched than saying, uh, you know, this breed. Because maybe you can argue that breed is arbitrary in some way, but, but weight is hard to argue that's arbitrary. And then we do need to move on. So. Yes, because you're now for what it's worth. Yes. Uh, someone in the front just asked a question about oftentimes liability insurance in order to get coverage will have restriction on certain types of breeds. Again, this could be very fact specific. If there is ever litigation about disability discrimination, sometimes the issue can be what is a reasonable accommodation. And if it is impossible to get insurance otherwise, that might be viewed as an acceptable circumstance to not allow a survey. But again, it's very fact specific. And before trying to do anything that might upset someone that may be able to claim the disability or protected class, talk to an attorney. Now, let's go to the slide here. We talked about this before, but Anytime someone's going to move into a unit, they should do a walkthrough to establish the condition of the unit. Guess what? Landlords should be doing this too. Because if there is a dispute at the end, a landlord could find themselves getting sued over a security deposit. If they documented the condition of the, move of, of the, of the unit before moving in, they would also be able to protect themselves. OTA recommends that the move-in inspection occur before move-in or within the first five days of occupancy. You would be surprised the number of people who do not document this. It is very important to document it for all sides. And in the 21st century, take pictures, video, use a smartphone. And also, for, this is for tenants, uh, be very careful to take care of the apartment if you have guests over. Please don't have them draw on the walls. Do not move into a unit that is uninhabitable or not up to the conditions promised. And also, if the unit is not moving ready, the tenant can and should demand that the landlord complete significant repairs. A lot of times disputes happen because someone said, oh yeah, I'll repaint this or I'll redo it, and then you get months if not years into the tenancy. It just gets very unpleasant for everybody. Okay, I think that this is probably a good time to take a break. Let me just, we'll take a break in just a second. I just want to add on the, the pre-move in and the condition when the tenant moves in. I just want to say, I, I have, I've seen in many leases, maybe most leases, something that says the tenant warrants that everything's habitable, it move in, everything looks great, the tenant signs that a month before they've ever seen the place. I have never seen that actually really help the landlord or do very much to protect the landlord against evidence that the place was in shambles when the tenant moved in. So I know you're not going to take it out of your leases on, on my say-so because I'm a tenant lawyer, but uh, don't think that just because you put something in the lease that says that the tenant warrants that the apartment looked beautiful when they moved in, that, that, that a judge is going to look at that and say, oh, well, I guess the place must have been 
Do you on the flip side? I all, can everyone hear me? Yeah. In here, and then we're going to take right. And then we're going to take a break. Even if Elise has something that is outright unenforceable, I never advise someone to sign it knowing that they'll be able to get out of it because that could still require litigation and it is still going to weigh against someone that they nonetheless sign something even if it turns out to be unenforceable. So you know what? Frankly, a problem that I notice a lot is that small landlords tend to use do-it-yourself leases from online that they don't vet for specific DC laws. Frankly, I would recommend to everyone in the audience, I don't know how much it costs, but it is worth paying the licensing fee to be able to use a template lease from one of the bigger consortiums out there. It had been vetted by attorneys, and that being said though, Still, never hesitate to have a lawyer look at a lease before offering it to a tenant, and especially if the landlord insists on doing it themselves, please, please get it reviewed. I can tell you from my experience, it is worth, even if it costs $200 to hire a private attorney, it is worth that cost. And with that, we're going to take a 10-minute break uh, for, you know, water, bathroom, whatever, and then we're going to jump in with security deposits, and I'm going to take over.